so much, Dorcas. So this is going to be a fun and engaging conversation <laughs> this afternoon, right? Yes. So the way we're going to start it off first is I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves, and then I have a brief statement about why this conversation is so important at this time in history for us. And then we're going to open it up to questions to the panel, and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions from the audience. All right. So as Dork has shared, my name is Rebecca Nelson, and I'm a founding member of OPAL, which I refer to as the Ohio Progressive Asian Women's Leadership Group, but it has become a statewide organization, but its founding sisters were done here in Columbus, Ohio. So with us this afternoon, we have to my immediate right, Andy Chow with Ohio Public Radio, Angela Ann with Channel 10, and Michael Lee with the Columbus Dispatch. Please join me in welcoming all of you. In, oh, oh you, are you deferring to Angela? I was going to defer to Angela. Okay, don't <laughs> defer to Angela. Okay. Would you like to kick us off with a brief intro, what you'd like to share with the audience? Sure today? thing. Um, yeah, I'm Angela Ann. I've been in Columbus for 22 years. I grew up on the East Coast, went to college on the West Coast, just somehow landed right in the middle. And I didn't think I would be here for 22 years, but Columbus is an amazing market. It's a great news station, and this has become home. Um, I was born in Baltimore, Maryland, and I know we've got this on our questions later, but I, one of the questions is how have I faced um, challenges to my personal identity? And so it's really interesting growing up Asian in a very Caucasian town and having to kind of deal with those mental challenges of where do I fit in? And so a lot of that, I think, plays a role into me today as a journalist, but I'll leave it there. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Andy Chow. I'm with Ohio Public Radio State House News Bureau, and so that's all of Ohio's NPR stations and all of Ohio's PBS stations. I'm the news editor there. And what I do is I cover state government issues. So we're actually based out of the State House. We follow what the governor does. If you are familiar with the Wine with DeWine press conferences from a couple years ago, I covered every single one of those press conferences. And we also cover what the state legislature does. So if you're familiar with what's going on with redistricting, that's also something I've been covering lately. And I'm very happy to be here. I grew up in Worthington, Ohio, so I grew up here in Central Ohio. Uh, my mom and dad are right there, and you can embarrass them by saying hi to them at some point. Hi, mom and dad. Um, and I am, I am Chinese American. My my uh, grandparents came here from Shanghai, and uh, had my dad and one of my uncles here in Kentucky. My grandpa uh, and grandma were pastors, and so they came here to study theology, and then they went back to Taiwan. So they escaped uh, China and then went back to Taiwan. And because they studied theology in Kentucky. They became Southern Baptist ministers in Taiwan. And I always like telling people that. <laughs> no, it's, it's a real thing. I, my, my grandpa was a Southern Baptist minister in it. Taipei, Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm Michael Lee. Um, I know Dorcas just introduced this as esteemed, but I've actually only been a full time reporter for a year. Uh, actually, a recent graduate of 2020. Okay, that's not. Okay, that's not as recent as I thought. Uh, but no, yeah, I uh, actually was uh, born in Columbus, grew up in Dublin, uh, went to Ohio State, you know, lived here basically my entire life. Um, left Columbus in 2019 to go to Chicago for around a year and a half where I went to grad school and reported at, a lo at one of the papers in Chicago as well. And then for full-time work, I moved back here um, and started at WOSU last, uh, almost exactly a year from this month, actually, yeah. Um, so started there a year ago, worked there for around six months, and then transitioned to the Columbus Dispatch, where I am now as a K-12 education reporter, so, yeah. I'm also, I'm Taiwanese-American, um, and I'm very proud of that. I don't know why. <laughs> it's weird, right? I know, right? It's kind of a strange thing, and maybe that's part of the conversation, is that why is it weird to say that and yeah yeah, yeah for sure. sure all right so we're going to kick it off right away i want to talk about a little bit about why this conversation is so important at this time in our history the last two years the number of bias and violence towards asian americans living in this country have been off the charts there's always been that bubbling along but over the last 
two years, it's been over a 300% increase of what's been documented nationally. And we know by hate and bias crime data that most never get documented at all. So that sort of jump is alarming, right? Uh, the other piece is that about 128 incidents were reported in this state last year alone. Um, and I don't know if any of you follow Axios, but they produced an article recently where they did a study. And they showed that 21% of US adults who say, they now say that Asian American Pacific Islanders are at least partially responsible for COVID. Mm -hmm. Asian Americans, people living in this country, are at least partially responsible. 21% of adults living in the United States who participate in this survey, which was up from 11% in 2021. So you see the trajectory is not going the way we want it to go. The same article referenced that 33% said that they believe Asian Americans are more loyal to their country of origin. So it doesn't matter how many generations you've lived here. You're more loyal to your country of origin, which is up from 20% in 2021. Again, the trajectory is not going the way we would hope it would go. And among the Asian American Pacific Islander residents that they surveyed, only 29% said that they completely agree that they are accepted in the United States, the lowest of any ethnic group, racial ethnic group who's been surveyed. I wanna say that again, only 29% feel fully accepted for all of who they are in this country. These studies were led by LAUNCH, which is leading Asian Americans to unite for change, and TAC, which is the Asian American Foundation. And one thing that we all know we've been monitoring lately is the anti-China rhetoric that has been used on both sides of the political aisle during the political campaign season, which we are in the middle of that trajectory as well. And these studies have shown that anti-China rhetoric is the most closely directly tied to the uptick in violence and bias against Asian Americans living in the United States. Okay, so with that, as sort of setting the groundwork for why this is so important, a big part of this piece is how our media reports, is able to report, helps lead conversations and perspectives on these realities that are happening to us. So the first question that I'm gonna to pose to our three panelists is how do you balance your personal and professional lives and roles when reporting on issues affecting the AAPI communities? And I'm gonna let Go with the volunteer. Who would like to volunteer to address that question first? Andy, you may start. Yeah, I'll start. Oh, great. Well, I'll I'll start with it like a stream of thought, and then you just cut me off at any point. But it's particularly because of the things that you just mentioned. It's been particularly hard for me because of covering government and politics, where this is the kind of rhetoric that's been coming out a lot lately. Covering uh, the COVID nineteen pandemic from the beginning of it. Um, and then covering politics where, like you said, so a recent example of this is the Democratic nominee for the US Senate in Ohio ran a campaign ad where he said China, I think 20 times. And he's like, China's to blame, China's to blame. He's saying this over and over and over again. And it's repeating a lot of rhetoric that you usually see from the other party. And it has become part of the playbook to bash China, which in our reporting, we can spell out very clearly why the US has issues with the Chinese government and the actions that the Chinese government have been taking. But then there is this lack of nuance in these ads to make that difference clear, to say we're, we're criticizing the Chinese government, we're criticizing the Communist Chinese Party, but instead it's just, it's anti-Chinese rhetoric, and like you said, it can result in uh, anti-Chinese sentiment here in America. And sometimes, and I'll be honest, when I first started reporting, I sort of shied away from tackling these issues because I was afraid that if I did take on these issues, I would be seen as biased in some way or have some sort of agenda. And it's taken a long time, but I finally realized that it takes people like us who see the problem 
because there might be other journalists who are not like us who don't realize that it is a problem. This might be a small example, but in 2016, that was the RNC, right? In Cleveland, 2016? Yeah. In 2016, the Republican National Convention was in Cleveland, and we all got to go, and it was really great to be able to cover it. And every day, the Democratic Party here in Ohio had an event to counter what the Republicans were doing. And this was the year that Ted Strickland, the former governor of Ohio, was running for US Senate against Rob Portman. And he had a press conference and then a gaggle afterwards. That's when all the reporters get together and put their microphone in their face and ask them questions. And he, uh, Ted Strickland, the Democratic uh, nominee for Senate said, you're gonna really love it. We've got all this new campaign stuff. We're actually passing out fortune cookies right now. And you open up the fortune cookie and it says, Rob Portman, uh, China's best senator. And reporters were like, oh, tell me more about this, tell me more about that. And then I started getting a little like flushed and a little nervous because I had a certain question and I was waiting for any other reporter to ask it because I was afraid if I asked it, it was gonna be seen as bias. But nobody asked it. I finally got up the gumption to ask it and I said, are you afraid that this political um, gimmick, this, this uh, there's another word for it, but this, this thing that you're doing, this thing that you're putting out there, might be seen as harmful to anti, or to, to Asian Americans. Are you afraid at all that this could be seen as, as th that this could some way come back again? I asked it more delicately when I actually asked it. And he was flustered and he didn't understand. He's like, well, I'm not, I'm not criticizing Chinese Americans, I'm criticizing China. And I said, well, fortune cookies are not Chinese. They're Chinese American. And he's like, no, but you get them at Chinese restaurants. I was like, right, Chinese American restaurants. And I just kept, he's just so flustered. He just didn't know what was going on. And you could see that the other reporters didn't know what was going on either. And when you dig into it, and I ended up calling, I was up in Cleveland, so I ended up calling the uh, Cleveland Chinese Advocacy Group. And they mentioned that there has been a long problem with people using these political gimmicks, these different things that you hand out, um, in graphics, Jim Renacci, a Republican, ran an ad saying that like using uh, Chinese carry out to go boxes and different images. And it all stems from this idea that uh, Chinese Americans are foreigners, that they are the other, and that you should be afraid of this other thing. And the campaign ended up, sto they stopped using that, um, they stopped, the prop, that's the word I'm using. They stopped using that campaign prop, they realized then they apologized for it. It was something that never would have been asked if I didn't ask it. And so that's an example of just knowing that I needed to sort of come out and use my knowledge for the benefit of others. Something that Andy said that really struck home is representation, right? And that is the reason that we're here because without that, that would have gone unnoticed and it would have been recycled probably to the next candidate. Oh, well that worked for him, so I'm gonna go get my own fortune cookie. Um, the one thing I think that I can uh, um, align with you is whenever there is a story that is about Asian Americans or whatever, I'm like, I don't wanna be the one to cover it, right? And I'm thinking to myself, but why? Why is that wrong? I don't know if it's a cultural thing, I really don't. It's just innate in myself or you know, the Asian culture, I think, traditionally has been, a, you know, we're just in the background, we don't want to make noise, we just, whatever. And so when there are stories, like the campaign ad that came up, or even a couple years ago, we had the issue with um, the lieutenant governor and what he said about Wuhan, China, and um, do you feel it's offensive? You know, the first thing in my mind was, don't make me go and do the story. I don't even want to read the story, right? Because I don't want any... Um, perception of bias from viewers if I'm the one reading the Asian story. That was my personal feeling. Professionally, forget that. Why can't I read that story? I'm a journalist, first and foremost. And so my integrity and my journalism stands for what it is, fair and balanced reporting, regardless. And so that was a huge hurdle that I had to get over. Because then I looked around and I said, well, my colleague, Tracy Townsend, she's African-American. She's reading every story about the BLM, and she's fine with it, right? I mean, she's more like, you know who Tracy, my EP is here. And so to me, it was an eye-opening turning point of taking an inner pride of being proud of really who I am. I am a journalist, 
But at the end of the day, I am an Asian American journalist. So I have to embrace that in order to be, I think, better at my reporting. Um, with that said, sometimes when I pitch stories, I always have this inkling of making sure that I have all my ducks in a row, right? Is this a story that somebody else would cover? Does it hit all those check marks of being a story that is has viewer benefit or that people are talking about or that can empower change, right? Those are the you know, factors that we go through with every story, regardless of what it is. And I have to make sure it does all that. But then part of me says, where's that line where am I perceived as pushing it simply because it's the Asian agenda? Or do I succumb to maybe what people expect of Asian Americans is to pitch it and then just move on, right? And so as journalists, again, in really a, an industry that is changing with news that can go like this, it's news today and not news in five hours, literally, um, we have to maintain that line. I think that line constantly gets pushed back for other things that are deemed, well, that's, this is more important, or this is a better news of the day. Well, who says, right? So look at the ones who are making those calls in the management rooms or in the glass offices, right? Well, you're the one who says it's not important, but I'm the one to tell you and representing the other people saying that it is important. So let's revisit this again. Um, do you have to be a little bit more relentless? I know that I am, and maybe to the point that I become jokingly the white noise in the room, right? But I will, I will do it because if I don't, what are we doing to our industry as a whole? So that's kind of where I am. Honestly, like <clears throat> when I think about it a lot, you know, I'm 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 addicted to Twitter. Twitter is my life. I'm on it like 24/7. We have help for that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, uh, but it's something that I don't necessarily realize is because I'm kind of stuck in my own Twitter echo sphere, like echo chamber, Twitter sphere, whatever you want to call it, right? That you know, I don't realize that you know we all hang out with a lot of people in our industry all the time, and so we don't realize that you know people who aren't in our industry don't know that you know we necessarily experience these things like you know talking about how oh will I be called biased right if I pitch an Asian American story or if I ask a certain question like that stuff happens all the time and and you know recently there was uh, I think it was back in 2020 when the Black Lives Matter protests were happening there was a reporter up in Pittsburgh who was taken off of reporting she was a black reporter she was taken off of reporting on the protests because her editors called into question can you report on this unbiased? And and so that was a huge thing. She ended up leaving the organization, and um, because you know, obviously, if I were in this, if I were in that situation, I would too. You know, I, I'm in an organization that you know doesn't necessarily support me, doesn't necessarily think. But like, that's just one example of stuff that happens all the time. And so, you know, that's that's one of the reasons you know why I, I'm also in that sh the same shoes of. You know, if I say something or if I report on something, will I be called out by, you know, people, not even just, you know, necessarily editors, but our readers as well, right? Readers, listeners, stuff like that, you know, of how, you know, are you going to be by, like, fortunately for me, you know, through my working career so far, I've been supported in that way of, yes, you, you should pursue these API stories, you know, uh, especially here in Columbus, you know, I, growing up here, I didn't necessarily see a lot of stories really outside maybe, like, Asian festival coverage or like um, any you know uh, stuff on like you know I'm trying to think of like businesses right it's like Asian festival and business those are really the two most like common things that I saw when it came to the Asian American Asian and Asian American community here in Columbus so I think luck right now Columbus is in a spot where a lot of news organizations are realizing like oh, we, we do need to start covering these other communities we haven't covered in the past, and that includes the Asian and Asian American communities. And so, I mean, for me personally, you know, integrating my own identity, I, for, for those of you who are familiar with Central Ohio or grew up here, you know, and know Dublin as a suburb, it's basically a bubble. And, you know, a lot of people there, we grew up not knowing a lot of things, you know, not experiencing a lot of things that maybe our peers around the country experience, and that includes a lot of the Asian American community as well. And so for me personally, I kind of went into college, you know, not necessarily experiencing the same things, right? You know, I obviously experienced a lot of stuff like, you know, people making fun of my food at lunch and, you know, very standard common stories you'll hear around the country. But um, 
you know, that was one of the reasons why I got so interested in AAPI reporting and, and, and kind of trying to find those angles because I was like, this is my opportunity to learn about what's going on with everybody, learning everybody's experiences. And so that's kind of how I've integrated that into my, my work as well, so yeah. And you sh all should read Michael's work because it's really good. And when he, when he came to the dispatch and he started putting out these like stories that related to the Asian American community. I was like, they was really inspiring to me, Michael, so I'm glad that you're doing that. Thanks. So let's stay on this topic. We're gonna deviate from the questions we talked about. How much time do you have? <laughs> I, you I'm know, kidding, I'm kidding. Back when I was in grad school many years ago, there was a Asian American writers workshop out in Los Angeles, and one of their writers wrote a poem called Casper the Ghost. And it was about Asian Americans as ghosts in the system. And I wish I could go back and find that poem, but I haven't been able to find it. But I've thought about it over the years because it's not an unfair thing to say that AAPIs are ghosts in the system, in the county and the state, right? Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts about how do we elevate from being a ghost to being seen as living, breathing residents who are worthy of coverage locally. Uh, and it's one of the fabric, one of the uh, phrases that we've used a lot in some of the pushback against the egregious campaign language that's been used is our politicians need to stop using Asian Americans as acceptable collateral damage. Mm -hmm. They need to stop using AAPIs as acceptable collateral damage in the drive to win votes, mm -hmm. right? So I'd like to hear each of you talk about what can we do to change it? Even the most recent U.S. Census shows that the demographic shifts that have occurred locally and in the state of Ohio came from multiracial categories, Latino and Asian. Those are the chief top drivers, but that doesn't seem at this point to change perspective. What do we need to do? So I'll start because um, one thing that I found really interesting, we're in the midst of Asian American Pacific Heritage Month, and one thing we wanted to do um, is highlight it. And traditionally, a lot of news stations across the country will do this, right? They'll have like a little graphic with a bump with like some fact toys or something, right? And they'll put it in and out of commercial breaks. And I said, no, I, I want something more. <laughs> so I did. And I said, I want to hear why. Why people celebrate or why is AEPI Heritage Month so important to them? And I remember somebody said, well, will you be able to find enough people who are Asian to talk about it? No joke. It wasn't someone at my station, it was, I was just mulling this idea around with some friends. And it gave me pause, right? And it was almost like this aha moment. And something that I do talk about with um, my other journalists of color, because it's not just an Asian thing. It's not just a black thing. It's not just, it is an inclusivity that must include everyone from all races, including Caucasians. And I realized that I think to elevate the voice, it's not just elevating our voices, right? Because we all have been screaming from the rooftops. We all have been championing the cause in May, but we should be doing it year round. And so to me, it was even more important to find people who were not Asian, who were African American, who are leaders and influencers in our community to come out and say why they celebrate it, why it's important to them. Because otherwise it is an us versus them mentality that will just continue to churn year after year. And so we did it. I mean, we have everyone from the governor to police officers to whomever um, talking about why it's important to them. And I think with that will come education. And my hope is it gives people that pause who maybe didn't see us, that they will finally see us as fabrics of this community that can all be woven together. Yeah, and uh, say, I'll, I want to add on that too, um, because it's to me it's kind of a two-parter, right? It's it's on both sides. It's one there there are communities, there are you know different minority marginalized groups in Columbus, in in Ohio, and and there's just people. A lot of people just don't know because you know whether it's historically a lot of news organizations are the leadership is very white you know, or, you know, doesn't, hasn't necessarily, again, covered these communities before. And that kind of goes into my second part where it's, it's about hiring as well, right? It's, you know, the importance of media is to, you know, and, and this is like the worst 
you should we should never use this. It's not to give the voice to the voiceless, but it's you know, it's one of those things where you know, give a lot of these communities the opportunity to you know share their platform to you know, and, and that's just not something that's been done in the past. And uh, and I think that's one of the I'm gonna be completely honest. Like that's one of the unfortunate parts of being in the Midwest. And I've seen this again on on social media, in Slack groups, in Slack channels, where you know people will like. There, I remember there was a survey on Twitter for um, some uh, for one of the NPR Midwest bureaus in Missouri. Even though there's a whole conversation oh, yeah. there about how that's <laughs> the Great Plains region or whatever. Um, but basically, you know, they were saying, you know, why? What is making you hesitant about moving to the Midwest? to work in the Midwest as a journalist, as a reporter. And one of the biggest things was there's no diversity here. Well, one, that's not true. I always say that there is diversity here. You just gotta find, it, they're, just, they're just pockets. And a lot, of time, a lot of times because of you know, historical reasons, these communities are also very closed off to media and to reporters and stuff, right? And so it's, it's one of those kind of catch-22 things where it's like, how can you gain the trust of a community if you don't have people that they can relate to, doesn't they don't even have to be the same race or ethnicity, but culturally, you know, somebody who's dealt with uh, struggles in the past or things like that, how are you gonna get trust in those communities if you're not interacting with them, or if you don't have people that are trying to seek them out as well as sources or as you know trying to cover their stories and stuff like that? And so it's it's really this kind of twofold part that we have to do, you know, as journalists to. Uh, make sure we're not seen as you know ghosts, right? In 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 this situation, and so I think there's there's a lot that needs to be done. I think you know for one, even events even events like this, where it's like, hey, we have Asian American journalists in Columbus, or we have people of color, you know, in these newsrooms, in these organizations, you know, it's yeah, traditionally they have been very white, but you know, there I think this is this is stuff like this, and just continuing to do not just our, our reporting in our reporting work, but community outreach and, and stuff like that. That's how I, I would say, you know, we are going to, you know, prevent that, I guess, yeah. No, I would just, I, I agree with everything that Michael and Angela said, that especially like the points that Michael was making about how it's not just to get representation from the journalists that you put in the newsroom, but then when you have journalists going out and talking to people, who are the people you're talking to? And are you trying to seek out a diversity in the pot of people that you're talking to? And because sometimes there are like particular people who are more comfortable to go on camera, maybe jump at the chance to it, and then others who might need a little bit more convincing. And, and sometimes it could be a language barrier thing where somebody might say, well, maybe I don't want to put this person up a as uh, and interview them because maybe they have an accent. These are the kind of barriers that people face. And when you go over those barriers and you say, no, I'm gonna interview this person and I'm gonna trust that people can understand what other people are saying because usually it's not that big of a deal. Um, but those are things that I think used to prevent people from talking to maybe Asians in the past was were those types of barriers. And I think it's we need to recognize those and then blow past those barriers. So let's take this to a more personal level. Now, some of you have already shared some personal stories, but this is your opportunity to broaden and deepen those stories. So what challenges have you faced specific to your personal identity? And it can be identified broadly, it can be during your growing up year, during your professional years, but if you wouldn't mind sharing some personal stories about that and how you well, since Michael's closest to the younger years, oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm just kidding. Uh, you can go first. <laughs> uh, I mean, I know at least, you know, like I mentioned earlier, in terms of work, right, I've been really fortunate to have, you know, that kind of support in, in both organizations that I've been a part of in Columbus when it comes to pursuing API stories. But, yeah, definitely, I mean, yeah, growing up, it's one of those things, especially, um, you know, again, like I, like I kind of mentioned before, you know, I... It, it, there pe I, people, it's, I would say it's not a unique experience, but it's definitely an experience different from my peers, at least high school and in college, where, you know, I didn't have your typical tiger parents, right? You know, your typical, you know, my, my parents were kind of, um, you know, I was fortunate enough for them to be kind of this ideal of, you know, as long as 
you're happy and you're doing good work or work that is doing good for the community, that's all we really care about, right? And so that's something for me, like I was very used to growing up and you know, I obviously personally still cared about a lot of that kind of stuff, right? Like with grades and whatnot, but you know, heading to college, right? That's when I kind of was like, you know, you know, I grew up, all my friends were, all my, my closest friends here in Ohio, they're all white and like, that's one of the things that I got a lot from people, which is, oh, your friends are all your, like your best friends are all white? Like that's so weird, like that's so strange. And I'm like, you know, to me, and, and this is coming from other AAPIs as well, and so, and, and that kind of goes into the reason why, you know, I wanted to start reporting more on AAPI communities when I was at Ohio State, you know, when I, you know, was doing my internships and, and, and now full-time work, where it's kind of this, you know, instead of being like, oh, you know, this is what's, because this is, because I know talking to other people as well, that is what drives them apart from the AAPI community, which is kind of this, you had a different experience from me growing up, so we're not, we're not the same. And that, I know, a lot, that's what, a lot of the reasons why I, I've had friends that are like, I don't like the AAPI community, because it's so exclusive in that way. But for me, it was like, you know, I mean, I obviously like my peers, they haven't really done anything bad to me. And so this is really, the, again, the opportunity for me to kind of dig into these issues and dig into, you know, for example, I remember like early, early on when I was reporting uh, at, at Ohio State at least, you know, I was like, oh, you know, I'll do a story about, um, you know, it was when Crazy Rich Asians came out and it was like huge because it was like the biggest Asian representation we've had in Hollywood in quite some time. And so it was one of those stories of like, oh, let's talk to the AAPI organizations at Ohio State. For me personally, I know they're very vocal. They're very, you know, they, they want to talk about these things. And so it's like, you know, let's talk to them about what this means to them and, and, and you know, how, and cause like for me, it's like, yeah, for me, I was like, oh, that's really cool. You know, they talked a lot about a lot of stuff in there where it's like, again, I couldn't necessarily personally relate to growing up, but at the same time, it was like, that's not a, it's 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 not a bad thing that I'm different, right? In 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 some ways, maybe some old school journalists would say like, in in some ways you're you're objective, which is a whole other conversation that we don't have to have uh, today uh, when it comes to ob objectivity. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's 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 one of those things where it's like I feel like my challenges that I face was were kind of, you know, my my similarities helped me connect to the community, but my differences did as well because. It's, you know, like I said, you know, I, I, I grew to enjoy really talking to people and learning about their experiences, so. So, I'm 36 years old, and if you would have asked me three years ago, like, if I experienced a lot of racial bullying um, as a kid or in my younger years, I would have said no. And now, because it's be being talked about much more in the mainstream, it's really dawning on me that I ha was bullied a lot, or I was I did experience a lot of racist behavior directed against me, and I always brush it off as, oh, they're just playing around, or or it's not that big of a deal. And my big thing was I I never wanted to bring it up or complain about it because it really did pale in comparison to like other racist things I would see. And so I thought, well, who am I to bring this up when my other friends, my other friends who are people of color, my other friends who are black, are experiencing something on a whole other level, why should I be complaining? And I'm realizing, again, because we're hearing these stories more and more, like, oh, I, I now know why I sort of shudder at this and close in at that, because I experienced those things. Um, and, and I think that is part of why I'm starting to come out of my shell when it comes to coverage and trying to ask the questions that need to be asked. I was the one asking John Husted those questions when he was when he made the comments that he made about uh, the quote unquote China virus. And so that's an example of like how my childhood kind of played into. I grew up in Worthington, so just one suburb over of Dublin and I I too didn't have any Asian friends or anything. Um, but I did experience a lot of like bullying and people making the voice and pulling their eyes and all sorts of things that I just kind of played off as, ah, that's no big deal. And it was a big deal. And I didn't have any other Asian friends to really like back me up and say, yeah, that was wrong, man. Um, but I do now. And I, and I think it's kind of the, the, the good thing, maybe the ripping the Band-Aid off of what we're seeing here is that I do have friends who are hearing about what's happening in the world 
and can relate back to me and then sort of be the the people who kind of like are there to uh, stick up for me and stuff. So I'm not going to tell you how old I am. <laughs> I, I, I did that just to bring you up. <laughs> you did. You did out of my shell. But I will tell you, I grew up in a town much like Dublin and Worthington. And um, I would say for the first <clears throat> 40 years of my life, I did everything to negate that I was Asian American. Right? And you're like, well, why? Well, I grew up, like I said, in a very Caucasian town. There were Chinese and other um, Asian kids, but I... I don't know if I made a point to not be like them, right? But I was a cheerleader, key club, uh, yearbook captain, all, you name it. And I remember one time my mom had all her Asian friends over, and they all said, why doesn't Angela play with our children, right? And I said, well, Mom, I'm just busy doing all these other things. But I was doing things that back in the day weren't seen as like what the model Asian child should do. In fact, my sister was older. She was in all the AP courses. And then when I got to the same AP class, I remember I was like got a C. And the chem teacher said, are you sure you're related to your sister? <laughs> and I thought, well, what does that mean, right? And so little moments like that got embedded into me of like, what am I supposed to be? And so I think because of that, it made me even want to move farther away from, well, if I'm not seen as the model Asian child, I'm going to be the model mainstream child, right? And so I'm going to blend in, I'm going to be the popular kid and all that stuff. And um, it wasn't until probably in my 30s and 40s where it just started, I started to realize what a loss, you know? I look back and I, and I think all these things that my mom was making sure I had, Chinese school, learning the Chinese dances, the songs, all that stuff, the rich culture, what a shame you know, that California, I born and bred, chose to throw it away. Like she's the, you know, so, Beach Boy song um, girl. And I think the um, pivoting point was my best friend from college. Me, I mean, she, she said, is. I don't think of you uh, as Chinese, though. And at first I thought, oh, that's so cool. And I thought, but what do you see me as then? And it really got me thinking that, well, why? You know, I mean, we, we, wanted, we always teach our children, right? Don't, don't look through color lens. But at the end of the day, everybody has a lens of some kind. And... That, to me, it hurt. I'm going to get personal. Like, it hurt when she said that because I thought, well, gosh, if I'm not Chinese and people don't see me as American, where am I? Yeah, it's a lose loop Where do I fit, yeah. right? And now raising a biracial child, it's so much more important. I feel like my mom was always right. Like, but it is cyclical, right, that it is so important to instill that in when you're young because when you don't have it, then – what is your identity, you know? And so you either embrace it and and enjoy it. So that's kind of where I'm at. It was always hard for me because as a kid, some people would, I, I would talk about being Chinese and some people would say, well, you're not Chinese, you don't look Chinese. And then other people would make fun of me for being Chinese. And so it's like, it's kind of a lose-lose situation. Right. And I have, I have a mom who is, White, sorry, I <laughs> like she, I, who is German, Scottish, two percent Irish. Wonderful. Um, and then I have a dad who's a hundred percent Chinese, and so people would say, "Oh, you're fifty percent Chinese," and then you're like twenty five percent. And I would say, like, no, I'm just all of all of these things. Yeah. I'm I'm one hundred percent of myself is Chinese. One hundred percent of myself is German and Scottish. I'm just all of these things instead of taking like bit by bit. Mm -hmm. And that was like an identity thing that kind of took a while and. I have two children, and so they are, you know, they have a certain mix as well, and we're trying to teach them that they are all of these things. And it's not just German and Scottish, but, like, they, they have, like, roots here in Worthington. So, you know, we talk about how, what it was like to grow up in Worthington, and we talk about these things, and I think it's important to celebrate all of that instead of just saying, oh, you're only a little bit of this and only a little bit of that. And how many times have you guys been asked, where are you from? <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah. And I'd say, I'm from Jersey. And they're <laughs> like, no, where are you really from? And I'm like, I'm really from Jersey. Like, you want me to throw out my Jersey accent? I give you a quarter, yeah. you go call your mother. Right? Like, I'm from Jersey. <laughs> but I think when that question is posed and just thrown out there, like, so nonchalantly, people don't understand. As children, it does make them question. Well, I, I guess I don't know where I'm from. Like, mommy, daddy, where am I from? You know? And so those are things that we have to change so that kids 
at a young age understand their identity, right? And as that grows with them, so will that understanding. So, okay, I'm off yeah. my soapbox. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, that's just like to what you guys are saying, especially. I mean, that's why for me it's like identity and representation is just so important for us to have here in Columbus because, you know, you uh, so as like as a Taiwanese American, right? So many people would, a lot of people growing up, could d they don't know the difference between Taiwan and other Asian countries, right? And it's one of those things where it's like you know my parents are from Taiwan, my grandparents are from Taiwan, my grandparents' parents were from Taiwan. Like it's one of those things where it's like my my roots go really deep in Taiwan, and so it's like I think representation is really important because you know we, people and and I've experienced this recently in my reporting as well, where it's you know I I went back to my old high school actually for a story and. They, which boggles my mind, and, and at the same time, I'm not surprised of like how well spoken a lot of like high school students are nowadays. You know, my old high school, they started an Asian American like student club, student organization, and they were telling me at the end of the, like at the end of the interview, they're like, you know, we just think it's so cool, like that, you know, you're an alumni from like my school, and like you've taught, you've spoken to like senators and like stuff like that, and like to me, that was like wow, like. That was a really big like, I don't I don't really know what to call it like a just really eye opening moment right and and so stuff like that and like you know I spoke to a board member um, the f I think probably the f she might be the first Asian American board member up in Upper Arlington uh, and she went to go talk to some students too and they were telling her they were like like they they were treating her like a celebrity even though she's she's just like your local school board member and so it's like one of those things where it's like it. it it means a lot to the like. It means a lot to kids more than I think a lot of people have realized before. So yeah. yeah. So I'm gonna kind of try to combine some of the last questions that we talked about. One is a theme that came up while you were talking was the hierarchy of oppression. Where do Asian Americans fit in the discussion about being a minority in this country, and that sort of stacking up. And unfortunately, the way so many people gauge it is how many oppressions you have, right? So I'm thinking, Andy, about the comments you made about it feels a little bit self-serving to bring up Asian American issues when our friends, our colleagues, who represent other minority backgrounds have had other egregious things happen. How do we find our voice in that? So I want to wrap up some of these themes around that final question is what keeps you up at night I know thinking about the hierarchy of oppression and where I fit into that, where my community fits into that in a different way, an allyship way, is one of the things that keeps me up at night. And the other theme that kind of came up in some of your stories was the weight of microaggressions. Um, as Asian Americans, so often, it's been only in the last two years that the rate of death has been documented mm -hmm. so much. But what we've been primarily aware of have been the weight of microaggressions, the slights, the sort of sotto voce statements that they know you can hear in the back of the school bus. That's what we've been carrying for years. But just now recently, that trajectory of that sort of microaggression and bias towards actual assault and killing has gone on its own trajectory. So I just raise that as some of the things to consider as you each respond to what keeps you up at night. I don't know if I can. That's true. That's true. I don't know when I sleep. Um, I had to coll collect myself because it's very difficult. Um, what keeps me up is wondering what my daughter will face. Because to this day, I face those microaggressions every day at work, in public. So I would say that the one way to really stop this cycle is um, we have to get involved. We can talk all we want, but we have to take action. And that's not just us as Asian Americans, but as a collective group of people of color that we have to come together and say enough is enough. And so when those microaggressions come into play, and people hear them and they recognize them, don't dismiss it. And if you say, well, we'll talk about it. I'll, I'll talk to that person about it. It needs to be talked about in an open setting. And it can be constructive. 
do. You don't have to call anybody out, but you can say, this happened. For those of you who are aware, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who aren't, th these are th some things that we need to do because other people who may not be educated, right, or understand or face it, they don't know how to react. So let's take away that uncomfortableness and make it comfortable. Um, so for me, I, that would be my two takeaways, is just get involved and use your voice. My fake eyelashes are falling off. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, I, I'll just use Angela's answer. Uh, <laughs> um, I do worry about what my kids will face too. So, you know, during political season and you're watching a show and I'm watching a show with my kids and the commercial comes on and the commercial starts saying, China's to blame, China's to blame. And my kids are hearing this and all she knows is that she's Chinese and so she's th she's getting this messaging from a young age, and it doesn't. It that's why the lack of nuance, the lack of actually explaining the issue that America does face when it comes to competing with the government of China, it just it can have those ripple effects. And so that is something that that does not necessarily keep me up at night, but it is something that becomes really worrisome. Um, the thing that I think about too is that there's when it comes to not speaking up because you're worried about how it compares to us, to uh, how it compares to other acts of racism. I think what we've all realized is that there's a space to talk about all of it, and it doesn't need to be a comparison thing. And I think you see that with a lot of when we saw the demonstrations after the murder of George Floyd, you saw people from all backgrounds come together and say this is wrong, and we don't have to be weighing like, well, does it compare to this though, or does it compare to that though? It's all wrong and. Uh, I was at, unfortunately, the, the site of another um, act of violence in the community, and there were demonstrators out there, um, Black Lives Matter demonstrators out there, but then I saw uh, Asian people come in, and they said, if I am out there speaking against anti-Asian hate, I also need to be out there speaking against racism against black people, and there was this kind of like this cool mix of of things happening there. And I'm noticing that I think there might be this culture shift where we are seeing that there's there's room to talk about all of it and to shine a light on all of it. Yeah, and, and honestly, um, I wanna add on to that definitely, but I guess for me, like, yeah, it's, it's a lot, again, it's along the same lines. It's family, right? It's, it's being worried about family. Like, obviously my parents, they're both older. You know, my sister lives in, my sister lives in Brooklyn, one of the highest, I would say considered highest in the country when it comes to anti-Asian hate crimes at the moment. Um, and so it's one of those things where it's like, you know, I think about, you know, my, my five foot, she's older than me, right? But she's, you know, she's five foot, she's walking at night and like she, she like makes like, you know, joking comments to me all the time like, oh, you know, when you come visit, you can like borrow my pepper spray or like, you know, borrow my, and I'm like, it's like joking, but she's also like serious about it too because it's, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, you're walking around and it's just not safe, right? And, and so when, you know, that that's kind of, yeah, that's what worries me. And, and having these conversations, like you guys have been saying, like, is really important, right? And um, when it comes to, you know, talking about, you know, you know, the, was it, oppression and like tallying the oppression and stuff like that, it's one of those things where it's like, you know, we all, all marginalized people have to come together. All people of color have to come together because even within the Asian American community, there it's there's historically a, a lot of anti-blackness in our community, right? And and historically just a lot of racism, especially with immigrant parents and like immigrant, you know, the in the immig the you know, like you know, um, and, and and so it's one of those things where yeah, we have to just everyone has to come together. We have to support one another. You know, it's one of those things where um, yeah. You many you can it's not it's not a competition I guess is what I'm trying to say right? it's not a competition, and it's and so yeah I, I think you know both Angela and Andy have really hit hit the head on the nail where it's yeah we just gotta come together cover the you know talk about these things but also right as media as journalists our responsibility to also you know find these stories of people working together people having these conversations and you know and 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 talk about it amongst ourselves as well, not necessarily because 
we are Asian American, but because it's just important for our communities, other marginalized groups, but also white, like, you know, the white community as well, where it's, you know, they don't know about these things. And so if they don't know about these things, a lot of times people will just continue being ignorant, you know, kids will continue being racist to their classmates in school, right? And, and so it's one of those things, yeah, just having these conversations, and I think that's why, you know, while journalists, we're not above other people, we're not above our community members, we're not, you know, these, you know, what's, what I think the, the term is like the ivory tower, right, or something like that. Um, but at the same time, we are in a privileged, privileged, p p privileged position to be able to talk about these things and shed light on these things as well. Well, do, do, do get out. Who wants to ask the questions? Okay. Okay. Um, Would you introduce yourself, too? I am Chosa. I am a Columbus resident. <laughs> so something you mentioned about, like, the students being, like, very proud of your accomplishment, and it also, it reminded me of a podcast that, one of my favorite podcasts is hosted by two Asian Americans, that you don't hear a lot about the celebrations of Asian females you're the first to be in this role or like, you know, and making up, you know, celebrating those accomplishments of like Asian females. You're the only, you know, Asian employed in this thing or like you were the first person of like Chinese descent. Like, do you think that comes from like a subconscious thing where like Asians are just not wanting to make waves, like as you mentioned before, or is it like a bias thing where like people aren't kind of like picking up that like these are things that you should be celebrating? I think it's a little of both. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a state senator in Ohio, Tina Mahara, and when I realized that she won the Senate, it instantly clicked with me. Oh, she's the she might be the first Asian to be in the state Senate, and she's the first woman Asian to be in the state Senate. And I reached out to her, and she was happy to do an interview, and we talked about it, and it was really cool. Um, a few years earlier, and I don't mean to call this person out, but He's not here, He's an, he was an elected official. But a few years earlier, a person named Cliff Rosenberger was, was uh, appointed as Speaker of the House, and he is Korean. And as soon as he was voted on, I said, hey, you are the first Asian American Speaker of the House. That's a big deal. You wanna talk about it? And he walked away from me. And I said, like, is something, and he knows me, like, it wasn't like I was stalking him. And I was like, do you wanna talk about this? Didn't want to talk about it. I talked to his consorts and didn't want to talk about the fact that he was the first Asian American Speaker of the House in Ohio. We have an Asian American Speaker of the House in Ohio until um, he had to resign in disgrace. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was just, it's just, <laughs> um, but it's just, it's just strange. There, there's, there are two dynamics there. One, somebody recognized it and embraced it and did an interview about it, and there was a story out there about how. Tina Maharath is the first Asian American state senator. And then there's somebody else who, for whatever reason, did not want to embrace that. But to your question, I think it's a little bit of both. I, I seem to be the only one in my office to even recognize that as a thing. And then putting out the question, and then it's on them to say, are they going to hide and say, ah, no, it's not a big deal, or do they want to talk about it? And hopefully the tide is changing because um, on the heels of Tina Mahara, I saw a tweet from the Ohio Black Caucus um, early in May, and they said, we want to give a shout out to our Asian American colleagues, and they specifically named her. And so when you see that, right, again, no longer goes being seen, and I just think that when you see that kind of stuff, in your Twitter world, tweet that, retweet all you want, because I think the more we get it out there, right, the more it becomes part of the conversation, as opposed to a sidebar conversation, like a postman. Time for one more. Did you have one more question? Right away. Right. I'm going to look at Dork. We have time for one more. Well, my question is just how could we as a community like encourage more stories to be covered and kind of make sure that the people making the decisions know that there is a demand for these stories? I wouldn't go to the people who make the decisions. I would go to the soldiers. Seriously. Like, we're the soldiers, right? And so pitch it to us 
and then we'll get our army of soldiers, right? And, and the more we have voices, right? Because if you go up here, look at who's up here, and do they represent you? Do they understand you? Are they in your community even, right? And so if they're not, the chances are they're gonna say, well, where's the view of benefit? They don't understand. But if you go to people who are boots on the ground and we're out there day in, day out, right, we'll hear you. So I would say that that would be first step. Yeah. Yeah. But my boss is right here. Watch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all my stories. <laughs> yeah, I And don't think any story is, oh, they wouldn't want that. Honestly, yeah. today, I mean, we want it all, right? We will cover news of the day. But we want those stories that really shine, like put a spotlight on even the smallest thing in the community. And you're like, oh, but it's just that. Just that is actually just that, you know? And so let's let's make them shine. We can do that. So we've come to the end of our program. Would each of you join me in thanking our wonderful <laughs>